Welcome to the first instalment of the Drop Gold podcast uh, in 2022. Really excited to be bringing back the show uh, this year. And on today's episode, we're happy to be sitting down with an experienced veteran uh, of Rugby League. Uh, a player who's played both down under and here in the UK. It's none other than the man himself, Greg Eden. Welcome to the show, mate. How are you doing? I'm good, mate. I'm very good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. No worries, mate. Uh, looking forward to uh, having a good chat today. Uh, about your career, about the upcoming 2022 season uh, and just a general chat uh, on the podcast. Uh, so we'll waste no more time uh, and we'll jump straight into the episode. So I don't like to waste time too much, like I say, and I always like to get an insight on how teams uh, are doing in the preseason. So um, let us know a little bit on how Cass's 2022 season are going with uh, the new coach at the wheel and how things are building up for the start of the, uh, start of the year. Yeah, um, obviously we've got a new coach in Radders. Um, yeah. And I think it needed that freshen up as well. Um, everyone seems to to have a little buzz off it. It's something new um, and everyone's excited to, you know, for a new challenge kind of thing, as, as they're calling it, the new era down at Cass. Um, yeah. But every, everyone's bought into it. So, um, so far, mate, it's uh, things have been shaken up a little bit, different, different routines, different trainers and... Um, different training regimes, really. So it's um, it's new to it's new to us all, and I think everyone's enjoying it, though. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Uh, it's always good to have a, a like a fresh start in a team, and you know sometimes it's not a bad idea to bring in a coach uh, and just change things up a bit because players get restless and coaches want to move on to different things. Uh, and it's really really good that uh, Radis is back in the game. Uh, I think we can agree uh, as uh, not fans of Hull FC, but just general rugby league fans that uh, Radis was definitely uh, missing our game. He's a top coach. Uh, and he's a brilliant person to have in our sport. Can you tell us something that he maybe has implemented into your game that you might you felt you might not have had in your game uh, before? Um, I think he's, he's quite an approachable character. I mean, I don't think I can answer that um, that question too well as we've not played any games yet. Yeah, I've got nothing yeah. to back up with. Um, um, he, see, he seems easy to approach and he's got a lot of time for anybody that, that's that's willing to improve and um, it, it, it'll go out of his way to to do anything for you. So that that's what I've had so far of him, um, and I'm just looking forward to working with him for the rest of the year as well and seeing what that can bring me as well. Yeah, definitely, mate. Uh, and it's always good that a player and a coach uh, have a good bond because uh, I think it shows on the on the on the pitch. Obviously, we've not had the start of the year yet, so we're yet to see how all teams will perform. But it's always good to have a good relationship um, with your coach. Uh, so hopefully, cast it off uh, to a brilliant twenty twenty two season. Um, but we'll flash back to the start of your career um, at the same club you're at now, Cast Tigers. Uh, you made your senior debut uh, back quite a back uh, back a bit of time ago. Uh, against my team, Warrington Wolves. Uh, how well do you remember that day? Tell us a little bit about your debut. Yeah, um, I think. Well, back then, I think I played that. I played that game. I debuted, and I was still only part time. Um, right. The the because I'd only ever played in in twenties then, and I weren't full time when I played that game. Um, mm. So I think the deal was if if you make your debut, then you can come in and train. And I actually they picked me to. To play that game, and I was still in twenties. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think you'd get you'd get really get that now, would you? They normally have squads mm. full of young lads, um, ready to go. Whereas I were a, a pick from from deep down and out of twenty squad into that game. But um, after that, yeah, um, I think I, pl- I played following week as well against Wigan and, and Warrington and Wigan back in those days were were yeah. on, were on top, weren't they? And um, mm. Cass, we we were we were struggling down at bottom. Um, so for them two to be the first two games, I think were a big, um, a big reality check, and yeah. Um, yeah, it was quite tough. I think they put sixty on us that day, didn't they? Right, yeah. It's it's always tough when you're playing against those top teams, and that, like you said, making your debut against Warrington. 
Uh, and then, and then you know, playing against Wigan the following week, two heavy hitters in the league, uh, it's a big ask. Um, but you did it, and to be fair, you had a brilliant debut. Uh, you scored a try and an assist, even though you were on the losing side. Um, so as a personal performance, you, you've done quite well to uh, to break into the team and you've seen your debut, get a try and get a, an assist in, in a losing game. Uh, what did you do after the game? Was there a call to your mum and friends? What was it like after the game and finally being able to to play in that first game of your senior debut? Um, well, I was still I was still living with my mum at that point and um, she'd had, a, I think it was around my mum's birthday that time and she'd had a, she'd had a party organised for... <laughs> for for all the friends to come round and they were all on piss night before and, 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 right. I, and I were trying to really night for it mm. <laughs> and I could hear them rattling on till God knows what time but um, yeah I, I managed I were all right I, think I were up against Matt King that day as well he were a, he were yeah um, uh, he were he were a great at game back then weren't he so yeah um, from what I remember mate that that's all I'd ever dreamed of that cook like being a cast lad and debuting down at Cass on a hot summer's night Friday night and um, yeah, I can remember that being a special, special moment. Yeah, but I don't, I can't really remember what I did after. Um, probably just put some, got in an ice bath or something. I would have been sore after that one. <laughs> right, mate. And uh, I'm guessing there could have been a few drinks after the game to to celebrate your debut, or um, not that I can't remember that, mate. I can't, I can't right. remember if I did or not. Um, um, no, I can't. I can't remember. <laughs> Fair enough. You've uh, you've done a bit of a sensible one there. You've uh, you've made your senior debut, and uh, you've decided to go straight into recovery, jump in an ice bath, get ready for the yeah. next game. Um, but at this I'd... point, you... sorry, go on. Yeah, I think when when I were around twenty, I never really used to drink much. Uh, I, I'm not right. a big drinker now, as it is, but um, I can remember if I did ever go out back then, I'd go out sober and let all my mates get pissed, and I'd be driver. So right. I weren't really. Much drinker back then to be honest but fair enough mate yeah doing that (laughs) yeah that's it mate um but at this point you've played your senior debut uh you've uh you've made your debut for your boyhood club as well which it must have been a brilliant achievement obviously making your debut for any team's brilliant but when it's your boyhood club it's just something a little bit more special uh it was a top personal performance from yourself even though you were on the losing side uh, but that year you managed to only play three games. Obviously, you've made your debut that year. But after such a personal performance, did you find it hard to then break into the first team regularly, or do you think it was just something that had come with time? Um, at Castleford, particularly, I think um, a couple of my um, coaches with in the twenties team, I think they were pushing for me all that year to try and get a debut, right? Um, a de- debut game and. Um, it never came along, but I'm not sure whether it was to do with salary cap or they couldn't get me in first team or something like that. But um, it took a little bit longer than I anticipated. And then I only managed those two Super League games and then one Challenge Cup game uh, at Cass yeah. that year. But um, at the end of that year, I moved on, if you remember, to, to Huddersfield. Yeah, well, that's it, mate. Um, so I was going to mention, uh, you'd attracted a few clubs after your debut year uh, and you made the decision to move on to Huddersfield, like you just said. Uh, moving from the Tigers to Huddersfield, your boyhood club, to to a, a similar team in a, in a similar location. But how hard was it moving on from your boyhood club? You just made your debut that year, but you've had to move on to, and sign with a different team. What was that like? Yeah. I think back back then, I think Cass were in a lot of worse position than they were now. I think they wanted me as a as a as a player, but I don't think they had the financial structure around it right. to keep me, kind of thing, and. With, with the other offers that I had from Super League Tops, it was kind of hard to, to resist because I'd never really had a, any contract money at that age at 20. Mm. Um, and if I'd have stayed at Cassie, it'd have been next to nothing. And then I, yeah. I had to move on just for, a, just for a little bit of something. That's it, mate, so. yeah. Uh, and you did mention the, that the other clubs were offering you better deals, but can you let us in on the other clubs that were interested in your signature and what made you choose Huddersfield particularly? Um, at the time, I think... Huddersfield were known for letting. Well, there were a lot of my friends there. There were there were a lot of lads from Cass and Ponty area that were all travelling mm. through to Huddersfield. That were a factor. Um, they were they were just about breaking into top six, top five, and they had a lot yeah. of key players like Kev Brown and McGilvery and all that. Um, Luke Robinson, Bruffy. Yeah. Um, I think it was more of um, my agent 
kind of said that's probably the best option for you and a couple of adults around me were saying that's kind of best option for you mm. so i just went with that at the time um i think Le- leeds would were interested as well and i think catalans were interested as well but um that would have been a big move at a young age yeah and uh, i just thought well it's close to home half an hour away and they're quite a good club as well and i think what did it for me i think um they went and took me out stadium and stuff like that and mm. um it was just like a massive, <laughs> theirs is like a football stadium. I think it yeah. just wowed me as a young yeah. just to kind of get attracted there. That's it, mate. And to be fair, you made a brilliant decision uh, when you made that move to Huddersfield uh, and you broke into that team quite well uh, and you became a regular starter within weeks of signing with the club. Bursting into the starting 13 at Huddersfield must have been a dream come true for yourself. You're a young player and now you've just yeah. you've just uh, signed to a new club. Sometimes it can be difficult to settle in, but you, you've just absolutely smashed it. You've got into that team within weeks. Uh, what was it that sparked your ambition to improve week in, week out and, and keep that spot uh, at Huddersfield to yourself? Um, well, as a, as a lad at that age, I were always thriving to be in a full-time environment. At Cass, that never happened. I think I only mm. got... After my debut, I think there were five or six weeks left at season. So I'd only ever been full-time for five or six weeks. And then right. I went to Huddersfield. Um, so it were a big it were a big change from two, three nights a week um, in cast 20s. So I think it was just the, the step up and probably the training that I needed, full-time training that kind of progressed me as a player. And and um, and I don't know, I just always wanted to, to be in and around it. And when I got my chance, kept it. Well, that's it, mate. You made your senior debut at Cass late on into that season. Before that, you were playing 20s, like you mentioned. Um, you, you've really only just gone full-time, like you said, but you've already established your name at Huddersfield, even though it's so early on in your career. Was it tough to try and regulate your, your fitness and make sure you're at the top of the game with that big step up from uh, part-time to full-time? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I probably didn't realise how big of a thing diet and and fitness was at that time but yeah. when i moved to Woodfield and saw that third full-time environment and obviously sat they sat me down and told me i need to be a certain weight eat certain foods and that and it kind of just kicked on from there and um, i just i just thrived that environment i think Fair enough, mate, and I think it's good to sit young players down and speak them through the processes because sometimes they can get ahead of themselves, they can push themselves too far and obviously uh, it, it ends in in a way which no one wants. Um, your, your time at the Giants, although it was brilliant uh, for your time and getting your name out in, uh, in Super League, it was quite short-lived uh, and you were rewarded a, a longer deal at the club at the end of 2015. Um, but you were snatched up before you could begin that second year at the club uh, as you joined Hull KR on a three-year deal. What was the reason behind moving once again uh, and joining the red side of Hull? Yeah, um, I think, so I'd done my first year with under Nathan Brown. And then if you remember, he I think were it about three quarters, maybe a little bit later during that year, he'd, um, he moved on to Saints. Right, and, yeah. Uh, Paul Anderson took over for the rest of the, the campaign. Um, and then, as I was aware, I'd signed that new deal. I was going to be going back to pre-season on day one. Yeah. And then uh, my agent gave me a call and said, um, um, OK, I have put an offer in to, to buy you from Huddersfield. Um, and Huddersfield have accepted the offer. It's just down to you if you want to go or you don't want to go. Um, right. And I kind of thought, well, if they've accepted it, they're obviously wanting me to go. So mm. I'd had a meeting with OKR and then um, I think it was Craig Sandercock at the time, who was coach, and he just kind of lured me over, told me that he'd wanted me to be his number one and um, offer me a three-year deal then. I just thought, why not? If, if, if they've accepted it, then I might as well move on and, and try try something new. Yeah, fair enough, mate. And was it was it when you found out that news? Was it was it tough to to kind of deal with? Like for all you know, you've just signed a, a new deal. You think you're at the club uh, for much longer, and then all of a sudden, you've been told by your agent that Huddersfield have in, have accepted an offer, and uh, really that Huddersfield it's almost like saying that they don't need you at the club anymore. Uh, so, and yeah. how how did you handle that process? Um, I'm not much of a worrier to be fair so I think I can remember going in day one to pre-season and all, all lads had the bags lined out with the squad numbers mm. <laughs> and I didn't have one there so I was like hey what's going on here um, and then there the, the were a squad number list and there were um, 
and I weren't on it. And then it were a, I think I'd trained that day, asked no questions as I was just a young lad thinking, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, and Kit Bloke were telling me that, um, oh, we've not got it yet. And then it was that time, that night when I got home, when I got the call, and then it all made sense. <laughs> right, yeah. So um, you chose Hull KR as your next destination. Uh, at this point in your career, you've been at three different clubs, uh, even though it's so early on. Uh, was it something for you that you quite enjoyed moving around uh, to different Super League clubs? What what made you that type of journeyman player who, who moved around? Was it a challenge you liked? Um. I wouldn't really say it were a choice. It were kind of the career that I got pushed in and I had to accept it, but I were happy to accept that whole offer. Yeah. It were exciting. Um, I enjoyed my time at OK, like pretty much. I, I love, I, I commuted. There were a couple of lads that I used to travel with, Benny Kikane, um, yeah. Jamie Langley, and Keel Carlisle. We had a, we had a cast bus coming from, from our end over to OK. Yeah. Um, that were a good laugh. I enjoyed that, and 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 to be fair, I enjoyed my time at OKR as well. It were a good, uh, good two years. Yeah, mate. Um, you, like you said, you stayed at Hull for uh, two years or so, uh, and you didn't you didn't really stay at the club uh, for the full two seasons. Obviously, you went on loan to Salford, and also you went on dual reg, uh, which is now the Newcastle Thunder. Was that yeah. was that period bumpy for for any sort of reason, or did Hull KR just find better uses for you as a player yeah. and want you to get that game time elsewhere um yeah that's a, that's a funny story well the um the second year I, I think i played nearly every game in the first year at okay but the second mm. year i think i broke my toe or something in um in, pre- in pre-season right or i might have broke it about maybe four games in um mm. and i were out for a couple of weeks and benny kane started playing at fullback yeah yeah i think I think they preferred him for maybe two or three weeks. And a week while I was sitting out, I think Salford got the in that, um, or I must have gone to Gateshead for a game, that were it. Yeah. And Salford wondered why, obviously, I'd gone there for a game. So they asked if they could have me on loan for a month. And mm. Benke came and playing fullback. So they said, yeah, go get some, ex- go play some rugby at Salford. But I think mm. it only lasted two weeks and then they called me back. So. Yeah, well, that's it, mate. Uh, speaking about your loan move specifically, you did move to Salford uh, on an initial one-month loan, uh, which could also then be extended uh, by a week, uh, week-by-week basis. Um, you played uh, a few games at Salford until Hull KR then called you back after uh, Ben Kane got a serious injury. Uh, so, obviously, Hull needed you back. Uh, I know times like these are sometimes hard for players, as it's almost like an uncertainty in your career, whether you, you've got security at that club, but you're not needed almost. Uh, how difficult was this in your time and career? Obviously, you've you've travelling from Cass to Hull KR, but now you've got to go Cass to Salford. It's all a little bit all over the place, if you ask me. Yeah, I suppose it's um, it's just you just adapt, really. Um and you kind of know players at other clubs anyway. So for me to, I think it were an hour from me to OKR, from Cast to OKR. And then all of a sudden I'm going an hour opposite way to Salford. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I drove through myself one at first day, uh, met everyone. And then there were a couple of lads that I met at Uddersfield. Um, mm. Greg Johnson, I think, were there at the time that I met him. And we just shared shared lifts over that way. So yeah, yeah. it all worked out all right. But it, like I say, it only lasted three or four weeks. So it weren't too bad. Yeah, fair enough, mate. And now when I speak to players on the show who've experienced dual reg, uh, I always love to ask them the question on their thoughts on that system used by clubs in the game. Uh, and we've had mixed opinions. Uh, what are your opinions on dual reg having experienced it with yourself? How do you feel about that dual reg system rather than alone? Um, I think it, I think it's good. I think if you, if you dual reg, then you get like, I'm, I'm going to speak from... When I were at Brisbane, um, yeah, w- we had a big, we had like almost a first seventeen, and then in training, the the play we'd play against a, a second seventeen that were on outskirts of the team, but there'd be like yeah. two thirteen in a training session. But the second thirteen, all them players would be drafted out to the feeder clubs in, yeah, in yeah. Brisbane. Yeah, there were like five players would go to Ipswich Jets, five to Wynnum Manly, five to North Devils, and so on. Mm. and with that we haven't got the it's not really going to work here because for instance if Cass were going to put the players out to Featherstone or Featherstone have got their own ambitions of being in Super League aren't they so it's never yeah. going to work but, yeah. um, but 
I think I think it's good if you could um, if you could dual reg two or three players from your from who was on outskirts and call them back at any time if they were playing re- regular rugby in a in a championship team it'd, it'd be good but mm. there's always that argument that they're going back and taking lads positions that are getting paid at fair yeah. or getting yeah, paid yeah. another championship club it's a, it's a tricky one isn't it but I think it'll be good that reserves are coming back this year if it makes that comp a little bit stronger. Yeah, definitely, mate. Uh, I think the reserves coming back is definitely uh, brilliant. And like you said, uh, it makes everything just a little bit stronger. Uh, now, for me, the big turning step in your career is, is quite clearly your move to Australia. This podcast is brought to you in association with Recovery, the natural choice for rugby recovery. You're sore, you're low on gas, and life has a habit of getting in the way when it comes to doing all those little extras you need to do to recover properly. Going into game day knowing your body is in the best condition possible is the goal and your next performance depends on it. Well, Recovery has you covered. Recovery is reinventing rugby recovery. Check out their range of all natural products with prices that range from as little as £7 to be budget friendly for all shoppers. You can find them on Instagram at recovery or head to recovery.com or simply click the link in the description to take you straight to their website. And for an extra bonus, if you use the code DROPGOAL in all capitals, you'll receive a brilliant 10% off discount on all of your purchases. Fair, you've gone over there not knowing what to expect and you did a decent job to be fair. You can't turn a deal like this down uh, and you made that life-changing experience. You, You made it into one to treasure almost. But how did all this happen? Run us through the ins and outs and how your family reacted to, uh, and all the rest. Right. So um, it kind of stemmed from me playing, going on loan to Salford. Mm. Um, I think somebody from Brisbane, one of the, the scouts or whatever, must have been watching me play at KR. Yeah. Been been thinking, oh, who's this fella? We'll keep an eye on him. And then noticed I'd gone to Salford on loan. So then that sprung their minds to ask about me what was going on. Yeah, yeah. I think unwanted or what's going on or why what why has he changed teams so i got a random phone call off um off an aussie fella um can't remember his name and um he just said what's your situation um we've got i've got a team in nrl that's interested in you would you be interested and, I, and at time i was two years into well halfway through a three-year deal at ks so i still yeah. had uh, and i told him that situation and, and told him what what figures i were on and he said, oh, it's probably not going to work, mate, if you're on those figures, um, because we want, they, want, they don't want to pay you out of a contract. They just kind of want want you to come have a crack. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I think they mentioned it to Ulkar. And at the time, because we were on loan, Ulkar were kind of thinking, oh, we, we, we'll let you go if you want. We'll release you. Mm. Um, so I asked if they would do that, um, and that's how it came about. I, got, I asked if I could be released from me last year to, to take up this opportunity with Brisbane. Yeah. Um, and then I'd signed it all, and then they changed their minds and said, um, would you would you cancel it? Would you, we, we want you to stay, and we'll we'll offer you another four-year deal. Right. Um, at, at KR, but I'd already had my mind set on going out there then. So yeah, I just, yeah. I just stuck with it and um, and went for it. But it's something that I'd always wanted to do. So I just thought, well, I've got the opportunity and I was young. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm going for it. Well, that's it, mate. I think uh, rugby league players growing up, they always aspire to Super League is, for me, Super League's one level, but then Australia's like the big time. That That's where it all happens for me. Obviously, Super League's a brilliant competition. We've got top athletes, but so many rugby league players aspire to play in that NRL comp. So when you've got your mindset on it, I think there's no turning back, like you said. Um, the lifestyle in Australia is obviously quite different to the UK. Uh, and personally, this is just a little bit about me. My worst fears are uh, spiders, and the size of them over there is is shocking, mate. And you've got all sorts over there, snakes, spiders, all that. Did you ever have to run in with any of that? I'm just curious. <laughs> You'd be surprised, mate, because when I went there, living in city life, mm. I don't think I saw one snake or one spider. Right. And I was two years. The only time I did see a snake... Um, which was on the loose. Well, we did a we did a pre-season camp in out in the sticks in Gold Coast, and there were one of those black um, brown snakes. I think we called most venomous ones, and there right. were one of them that crossed path, and that's the only one I saw. Apart yeah. from, I, I did a promo at a zoo once, and they got because I were an English lad, they wanted to make it. Um, yeah. Wanted me to hold all Aussie animals like yeah, kangaroo, yeah. Uh, 
hold a koala bear and then I had to have a snake around me. It weren't venomous, but I held mm. a snake around my shoulders and that. Um, but yeah, that's that's on it time I encountered into one. But other than that, mate, I never saw any. Fair enough, mate. Yeah, must have got lucky because the videos I've seen, <laughs> mate, the size of them, I would not want them anywhere near my house. Like, they, they hide under your toilet seats and everything, I've heard. Imagine yeah. sitting down on the toilet and bloody having one of them under the toilet seat. It'd be <laughs> not for me, mate. Um, so you went over to us. You give that a crack, like you said. Uh, and then you returned to the UK in 2016 playing in the World Club Challenge. Uh, which is something I'd like to talk about. Um, you scored a try for Brisbane uh, against Wigan Warriors. Uh, there's been a lot of talk recently on the two dominant sides of the game, uh, Australia and uh, the UK, uh, and also France included, and whether Australia are almost putting in enough effort to grow the game over here. And some people argue that they treat the World Club Challenge like a, like, like almost like a training game for them. Uh, now, I just want to get your thoughts on maybe not so, ma uh, so much on what you think's going on in that situation, but how you think the World Club Challenge can be implemented and help the game grow for both Aussie fans to get involved and then the English fans. Because uh, personally, I think all the English fans love watching a game between the British and uh, Australian sides. But for some reason, it just doesn't seem to, to, to hit over there almost. What, what are your thoughts on all that? Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of get the feeling that they feel like it's a chore, whereas we think we're we're buzzing for it, aren't we? Playing against Aussies, um, yeah, and especially for for an English team to go over there, oh lads, you know, it's like an holiday for a minute as well as playing. Yeah. Like that's that's got to be up there on the pinnacles of your career if you get if you ever get to do that. Um, yeah, but I think when I were on opposite side, when I were at Brisbane and we came over here, it weren't. I don't think they see it, saw it as a training game. They wanted to win. Yeah. Um, it was it was serious, and um, we, I think we we came over for two weeks. Had a week in London, and then a week up in Manchester, and then played on the Friday. Right. Um, but but yeah, it was pretty serious, um, and we they, they definitely didn't want to lose. So no. yeah, they took it quite well. Well, that's it, mate. I just wanted to get your opinion as someone who's experienced that because when there's debates like that in the rugby league world, it's always nice to hear from someone who's experienced it, especially as an English lad, and then you've experienced it on playing for that Aussie side. I think it gives a, a better, almost like an insight into what the Australians really do think of it. Um, but yeah. I think it would be brilliant to, to carry that on uh, because, like you mentioned, the English people, we are, we get buzzed for it. So if the Australians can, maybe, the, I don't know whether it's the teams or the fans, uh, there's something for me that's not clicking. But like you said, Brisbane didn't treat it like any like training game. They treated it as a serious, they want to win game, uh, which is obviously a positive for the clubs. Uh, but hopefully we can implement that more a bit more in the future and a trip to Australia for any English side, like you said, that'd be just amazing, mate. Um, so after your time down under, you were given the chance to come back to the UK uh, and a brilliant thing, it's your boyhood club cast that have come in uh, and, and swooped you up on a deal. Uh, so you were willing to give up the sunshine and the sea for your boyhood club, despite there not really being many seasides and there's little sun in sight let's uh let's be honest in cast uh was it a no-brainer to go back to cast though um no, that, that that's probably the most the deal i've struggled with the most to to get right to decide on because um as much as i was loving it out there in brisbane that the, they wanted to offer me another deal um mm. and it were only because it were cast and i'd been away for two years and i think not that i'm missing home but kind of yeah. think back in my of it'd be nice to see everyone again and when you get your mates saying, oh, you're coming back or, or yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. It were kind of, um, that's what kind of did it. But half of me thinks that I, I wish that I'd have tried and stayed for another year, but it were only because it were cast that I thought, oh, I'll, I'm going to take it. If it were another club, I probably would have stayed. Mm, well, that's it, mate. I think uh, there's a big persuasion there when it's uh, when it's cast that's coming in. It's your boy or club. You've got to make a decision whether you stay over there in Australia. Brilliant lifestyle top quality rugby you've been offered another deal or go back to your boyhood club where it all started so i understand why that would be uh, a tough decision but that season you returned what a season for Cass and yourself for me that is one of the best super league seasons ever uh what a year you cast stormed that league in my opinion league leaders shield you know you've got to the grand final 
Uh, you were given the number five that year and uh, you were stuck out wide, predominantly on the left wing. Uh, and oh, it worked wonders. You scored an outstanding 38 tries that year uh, in in a season where you also scored five hat-tricks. Now, if we just pause on that for a minute, five hat-tricks yeah. in a season, mate. That is, honestly, I, quickly before I carry on, I've just got to congratulate you on that because that is brilliant, mate. Five hat-tricks is unbelievable, pal. Uh, so that is brilliant. <laughs> Uh, it was such a good year for yourself and the club. What do you think made that team? What was the driving factor behind the Cast Tigers dominance in 2017? Um, I think we had a good strike. We had a good balance of players. Um, obviously, get Gailey on on the left edge half, and then Benny Roberts at right half. Mm. Um, two diff- totally different players, and I think the balance was Benny used to run, and they were more like an outside back playing at six. Um, and then off that we, for first half of the year, we had Rangi as well, didn't we, before he left mm. the witness? Yeah. Uh, so there were good competition for spots in key places. And then we managed to get Zach as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just think there were the balance of the, the, the team. And, and as as well as that, there were an element of luck. There, were not, there weren't many injuries to a starting 13 that year. Right, yeah. Um, and, and the way we were playing, we were all just confident, I think. And... Um, it kind of it kind of were infectious throughout team. Everyone was just everyone was just loving it, um, and I think the way that we played that, that hot kind of hot rugby, yeah, play, yeah, just it about and everyone enjoys herself. And we were putting like 50, 60 on team sometimes, weren't we? So yeah, it was just it was just it was just a good year. Yeah, it was definitely a top year, and like you mentioned about the rugby, what rugby that was for fans to watch, honestly. The, the attacking rugby that got implemented uh, that year at Cass was honestly amazing. Uh, and I mentioned that the Tigers reached the grand final that year. Uh, for you, it will have been an experience that didn't go the right way at the end, but to experience the whole thing, the roar of Old Trafford, the lights beaming down with tens of thousands of fans watching you at the biggest stage, uh, it must have been some experience. Tell us about that, mate. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's... Um... That 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 night, build, the build up of the week and the the semi final win against Saints that were that were a pretty yeah. special feat to um, to achieve that. I didn't think that had ever, ever happened to, to me um, playing for Cass as well. Um, who would have thought Cass in a grand final before that year? I thought and so, especially mate. Yeah. hometown hometown club and me playing for him as well. That was it was something else. Um, but yeah, that night obviously didn't go our way. But I still I still not watch that game back to be fair because right. <laughs> But it sometimes pops up on um, in between sky in, in between sky games now done at the highlights. And yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. but yeah, what what an experience, mate. Uh, honestly, although it didn't go the right way, it's, it's such a it's it's like a dream come true for you, your boy old club, and you're at Old Trafford at the the, the biggest stage. Uh, so what a season that was for Cass, uh, and since that record breaking season. Uh, you've been at Tigers after being rewarded a, a fresh contract. Um, injuries seem to have occurred uh, a little bit recently, and it's something all players go through. Uh, when playing at the highest level, there's always going to be injuries, uh, and it's expected, uh, to be fair. Uh, and with this podcast being sponsored by Recovery, a company who specialises in speedy recovery, I want to ask you how you got over these injuries and what you put in place to ensure the same injuries don't happen again. Yeah, well, the, the pre, me, me um, last year, 2021, that season, um, I managed to pick up three hamstring injuries all the same year. Um, yeah. Which I think, I think it, well, the first one were a hamstring tendon at the back of the knee. And I think the area that it was made the other ones occur with, with it being that area. But mm. maybe as well, um, we were struggling for, for players and maybe I rushed back one or two games early. Right. Um, Possibly that, um, but but since 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 I've had that year with injuries, I, I'm always pretty good with my diet and hydration. But I just thought yeah. it's time to step it up a notch and 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 make sure that I'm always fully hydrated. Um, you know, eat eat good food and and just make sure that I'm on top of everything. Because the age that I'm at now at 31, it's it's kind of the age where you start picking up niggles and right. Uh, yeah. I just think for the rest of my career, I need to kind of um, kind of be on top of that to prolong it. So yeah, well, that's it, mate. Because at thirty-one years old, you're not, you're not, you're not at, at the very end of your career, but you're getting to that age, like you said, where a few bumps and bruises might come in. Yeah. Uh, so, like you said, it's you've got to keep on top of things. 
uh, and obviously you've learned that and now you're, you're healthy and uh, looking forward to the upcoming season. Uh, I mentioned earlier on in the show that you've achieved some brilliant personal accomplishments over the year. Uh, fastest hat trick in Super League history, uh, joint top scorer in this season for Castleford, uh, and and the first in a Super League area era. Uh, five hat tricks in a season. You've you've almost done everything in terms of scoring. But is there something that kind of tops them all for you? What is your personal favourite? Um, of recent times, I think. Um, my personal favourite's got to be the one against St Helens, the interception. Yeah, yeah. And that 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 one were a big buzz because every time we go to Saints, Paul used to say, um, "We've never beat these in thirty-one years." So that that for it never to happen, um, and we'd always come close. And then to, yeah. to pick that up in, in last kind of minute, I think we were in front anyway, weren't it? But they, they mm. could have possibly scored on that play to even it. Or but uh, that that were probably the biggest buzz I've had from a try. Yeah, um, as well as. The um the the try for Brisbane uh, in that World Club Challenge that all, yeah. all pretty buzzing as well because I think I went over there and no one expected me to play and kind of getting that getting that start yeah, for yeah. Brisbane and back over to England and then scoring against Wigan in front of all yeah. English English fans that that were quite a big thing and all my family were there as well then so probably those two stick out in my mind most. Yeah, mate, you've done some brilliant things. Uh, so I must congratulate on that. You've you've lived a career that some people just dream of. Uh, so uh, good on you, mate. Uh, and finally, with the 2022 season just around the corner, uh, I know we spoke about it a little bit at the start, but I do just want to ask what your expectations for the season are personally uh, and with Cass as a team and how they grow from last year with a new coach at the wheel. H- how is all of that coming into play with the season just so close? Yeah. It seems pretty good. We, as as players and that, we thought that we've probably not got this. Um, we, we didn't think we had as a tack right going into that York game last week. But right, it seems that we probably did because we put quite a nice score on the first half when we yeah. had as, as um, first thirteen out. So I think we surprised ourselves a little bit. That there's obviously still areas to work on. I think as as around as rook defence and stuff like that that we need to work on. But I think the sheer um, quantity of players all fighting for spots is going to be a big um, big hit for us this year because mm. we've got a deep squad we've got we've got a load of backs if if someone goes down then there's someone just as good to come in yeah. um, so I think I think that may help us this year but yeah there's definitely a buzz round place and we've, we're definitely setting his targets high but um, I wouldn't want to set I won't, I won't want to put a um, an actual right yeah yeah on it. As, as you don't want to count your chickens too quick, but um, yeah. yeah, we'll just we'll see how it goes. That's it, mate. Uh, you've got a, a more than good enough squad to challenge at the top, uh, and with Radford at the wheel, you, you never know what happens. It's a new coach, um, so it's almost like a like a new era, as as Cass call it at the club. Uh, and I wish you all the best for the new season uh, as a team and as a personal player. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this episode. It's been a brilliant chat with you, mate. Uh, and I do wish all you uh, and the cast lads the best of luck this year. Uh, it's definitely a team I'll be keeping my eye on this year. Uh, once again, cheers for coming on, mate. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and I look forward to seeing what you produce with Cass uh, when the season comes around. All right, mate. Thank you very much for having me. It's been good. Yeah, mate, definitely. Cheers. Thanks again to our podcast partner, Recovery, for sponsoring today's episode. Head over to recovery.com to check out their range of all natural products and remember to use the code DROPGOAL in all capitals at checkout for 10% off all of your orders. Yeah.